Hello and welcome to the NPTEL MOOC on Applied Electromagnetics for Engineers. So, in this module we will first tackle the problem of power calculation very briefly, we will have more to say about it later on and then consider the relationship between input impedance and the length of a transmission line and consider a few cases that are quite important uh, when dealing with these transmission line circuits. We begin by looking at the power calculation. We know that a transmission line carries a forward going voltage and of course, because the impedance is usually not matched at the other end, there will be a reflected voltage. So, there is a forward going voltage from the source going to the uh, going to the load and from the load there will be a backward traveling voltage wave coming towards the source. Okay. The question that normally occurs is that well there is this voltage V0 plus and the voltage V0 minus and there is a characteristic impedance of the transmission line Z0 even for the lossless case will there be any power that would be dissipated in the transmission line. Turns out that for a lossless transmission line no power will be dissipated in the transmission line. Eventually the entire power from the source will be delivered to the load. Okay. A more detailed analysis as I said will follow in a different module. For now, let us just look at very briefly what is the power carried by the transmission line, what is the power that is carried backwards and what is the relationship between all this. Okay. So, let us dig right in by assuming that the source is a phasor okay, producing a voltage some V0 e to the power minus j beta z and I have a source whose current is again a phasor producing a current of I0 e to the power minus j beta into z. Okay. Please note that these are phasors, the corresponding expressions in terms of time and z is given by after converting this phasor into a proper uh, equation, what will you get? This would be V0 cos omega t minus beta into z. Similarly, the current that you are considering as a function of both time and z will be the current I0 cos omega t minus beta z. Suppose I consider some constant z plane, okay. it does not matter what plane that we are considering, but suppose we consider a constant z plane in which case it can simply represent a source, okay. it does not even have to represent a transmission line. So, for this constant z plane, what would be the average power that is dissipated? So, what is the power that is dissipated instantaneously? that is Vs of t multiplied by Is of t in a given resistor, oh, well I do not need a resistor here because I know the current Is here and then you average this one over the time. What is the time average? Suppose x of t is a function of time, then the average of this x of t over a time t is given by this integral 1 by t integration over any time period t x of t into dt. Okay. If you find what is this average power, you can see that the instantaneous power will be cos omega t consider z equal to 0 a constant plane. So, that this would be V0 I0 cos square omega t integrated over one time period of this uh, time variation uh, which will be related to omega what you get is V0 I0 by 2. In fact, this relationship you already know because the peak value of the voltage is V0 by root 2 sorry peak value is V0 the RMS value is V0 by root 2 the RMS current is I0 by root 2, the product of these two will give you the average power. Okay. Now, we have a transmission line whose positive going voltage is given by V0 plus peak value e to the power minus j beta z. Similarly, the current that would be carried will be I0 plus e to the power minus j beta z. Okay. Again, these are essentially phasors that we are considering you can go from the phasor to the average power. When we do that, there is a small problem that might come up. Okay. In general, I know that I0 plus can be written as V0 plus divided by Z0. Even when you consider V0 plus to be a real quantity, which sometimes it may not be, Z0 to be a real quantity, then there is no problem. However, in general for a lossy line, Z0 is complex or even when the line is lossless, V0 plus might be complex. This complex only indicates that this source is having a certain phase difference with respect to the current and that could be for a different reason. Okay. So, what is the power that is carried by this positive going voltage? 
you will have to multiply these phasors after converting these phasors into the time domain multiplying and then writing this and it will turn out to be v0 plus square divided by 2 into z0 in this case we are considering the characteristic impedance to be z0 in general this can be written as v0 plus magnitude square divided by 2 z0 case z0 is considered to be real without doing any work if i were to ask you what would be the power that would be carried by the negative going voltage you will be able to write this as v0 minus square divided by 2 z0 correct so when you write like this v0 minus magnitude square by 2 z0 you know that v0 minus can be related to v0 plus through the load impedance gamma l and this load impedance gamma l will then tell you the amount of power that would be reflected in fact gamma l was always giving you the ratio of the reflected voltage v0 minus to the incident voltage v0 plus this time when you substitute for v0 minus from this expression into this expression for the power carried by the voltage in the backward direction this turns out to be magnitude gamma l square times v0 plus magnitude square divided by 2z0 if you identify this power with the incident power then the power that is reflected will be given by magnitude of gamma l square times p incident okay so you see that this is given by magnitude l square into p incident and therefore the ratio of the power that is reflected to the power that is incident is simply determined by gamma l or the magnitude of gamma l okay now you might ask what happened to the lossless condition that we derived well we only did half the part right we considered the source to have generated a voltage the voltage came hit the load but the load was not matched the characteristic impedance therefore produced a reflection now as the voltage comes back right so at the voltage we have some power dissipated in the load but there is a power that is not dissipated that is coming backwards carried by the negative propagating voltage or negative traveling voltage as this voltage comes in if i have a source which is matched to the characteristic impedance then this reverse power or you know reflected power will be completely absorbed if that is not absorbed then there will be one more reflection here which will then carry some power and because reflection magnitude is less than 1 the power carried again will be less then there will be power carried backwards and this infinite series will happen such that every time there is a reflection the amount of power carried by that particular voltage will actually go down and down and eventually reach to zero i did not say that in a lossless transmission line the moment you connect the load i mean the the power will be dissipated it actually goes at infinity i mean it can potentially be at infinity but if you terminate one of the ends with a characteristic impedance uh, so that there is a proper matching happening then there won't be any further reflection and all the power will be delivered to either the source or the load wherever you have achieved the power match usually you want to achieve the power match at the uh, at the load side okay but this is something that you have to remember so the reflected power is given by magnitude of gamma l square times incident power and the difference between these two will be the one that would be delivered to the load there is one additional way of deriving this relationship i know that time average power has to be magnitude of the voltage square divided by 2 z0 considering this is the time average power right considering only the lossless transmission line case that i am considering okay so this is the power that is actually carried by this is the average power that is carried by forward going voltage i can obtain this by this particular mathematical relationship i take half real part of v0 plus i0 plus complex conjugate right let us go back where this v0 plus i0 plus are not just ordinary v0 and i0 that you know but these are the phasors that we are considering so if i know the phasor forms of these so i know this is nothing but half of real part of the phasor for the forward going voltage is amplitude v0 plus e power minus j beta z the phasor for forward going current will be i0 plus which can be written as v0 plus by z0 but more importantly because i am complex conjugating this one this becomes conjugate here the amplitude gets conjugated okay and e to the power minus j beta z becomes e to the power plus j beta z clearly this into this will be equal to 1 
and I0 plus complex conjugate can be written as V0 plus complex conjugate divided by Z0 assuming Z0 to be real and what I get is half of V0 plus magnitude square divided by Z0. So, you have to remember this if you know the phasor forms you can take the voltage phasor, current phasor, conjugate the current phasor. So, take the voltage phasor, current phasor, conjugate the current phasor, multiply by uh, both of them ok. So, that the terms E power minus J beta Z and E power plus J beta Z cancel with each other and give you a product of 1 and you get the average power ok. You do not have to uh, I mean this is the way to show that you get the average power using the phasor relationship. So, this was all about simple power calculation we will not do the exercises related to that, but what I want to do in the rest of the module is to give you some interesting inputs about the value of the input impedance of a transmission line whose length is some L and how is it connected to the load Z L ok. We consider again the transmission line of characteristic impedance Z 0, this could be terminated in a variety of loads, we can denote this load as Z L please note that this at Z L is not indicating an inductive load, it could be any loads that I am considering just the way that I am denoting this Z L in this denotion the, the capital L stands for load not for the inductor. The transmission line has a length L and what I am interested is to find out what is the input impedance of this transmission line. Of course, I know what is the input impedance right. So, this is nothing but Z 0 into Z L plus J Z 0 tan beta L divided by Z 0 plus J Z L tan beta L. This is the relationship that I know of ok. Consider a special case where I take the load Z L to go off to infinity that is I open circuit the other end. So, when I open circuit let me denote the input impedance seen from the transmission line as Z O C ok. So, this is the situation that I am considering I have open circuited the transmission line terminals and I am trying to measure what is the input impedance here of a transmission line whose in characteristic impedance is Z 0 and a length of L. You know what this is by substituting for Z L equal to infinity or Z L going to infinity you get this one as minus J Z 0 divided by tan beta into L. From a similar analysis I know what will happen when Z L goes to 0 that is to say I short circuit the load side then Z S C will be equal to plus J Z 0 tan into beta L. Look at these two equations carefully. If I do not know what is Z 0 ok in a typical practical scenario you do not normally know what is Z 0 you can only estimate what is the value of Z 0. If I do not know and I want to measure Z 0 there is a very simple procedure for us to follow or of course, this has its problems, but looking at the equation there is a simple procedure. I can take the transmission line open circuit the other end ensure that this end is open circuited. So, that no current flows in measure the input impedance here what I will be measuring is Z O C then replace the open circuit by a short circuit connect a piece of wire out there and then measure the input impedance here. When I take the uh, two measurements then I can multiply this Z O C and Z S C and take the square root of this to obtain Z 0. You can see that very easily right. So, multiplying both sides will give you um, multiplying both terms will give you will cancel out tan beta L on both sides minus J and plus J multiplication will give you 1. So, the numerator Z 0 and Z 0 will give you Z 0 square. So, when you find Z O C and Z S C you can find out what would be the characteristic impedance Z 0. In fact, if I take a printed circuit board and then I want to measure the epsilon r the relative permittivity of this one ok. One way to measure the relative permittivity is to actually draw two micro strip lines over here identical micro strip lines ok. One micro strip line is left open circuited the other one is short circuited by connecting it to a ground plane via you know by actually drilling a hole and then connecting a short circuit by placing a small conductor so that it goes down and connects to the ground plane and from the other end connect a voltage source. So, you can connect a voltage source or you can connect an impedance measuring bridge over here measure the impedances on the two ends from there you find out what is Z 0 
and we will later show that z0 is given by, I mean we already know that for a lossless line it is given by square root of L by C, but this C will be dependent on the permittivity epsilon r. So, which then allows you to find out what is the permittivity or estimate the permittivity. This is not a very accurate method, but for most applications this method is alright. So, this is how you can actually use the knowledge of the measurement of the input impedance okay, for various conditions of the load in order to estimate the unknown value of the characteristic impedance itself. In practice this is not exactly how it is done, but I just told you that it could be one, it is not very accurate, but okay for some applications or most applications. Let us go back to the input impedance expression okay, and I want to consider again only the special case of short circuited load. I know that short circuited load is given by or the input impedance of the short circuited load is given by plus j z 0 tan into beta l. I know what is beta, beta is given by omega by u p and for this transmission line I know that u p is given by 1 by square root l c right and therefore I can write beta as omega into square root l c where l and c are the distributed inductance and capacitance values of this transmission line. So, I go ahead and write that one and instead of writing this small l, I will write this as delta, where delta is a small distance away from the load. So, you can think of this transmission line which has been short circuited and this length of the transmission line is this delta that I am considering. What is that length, I mean what is the input impedance seen here of this uh, short segment length? You can obtain that one by going back to this expression. So, beta will be equal to omega square root L c. So, you will get j and I know z0, z0 is nothing but square root of L by c and b tan beta delta can be approximated as beta into delta because I am considering delta to be very small. So, the length of the transmission line is very small compared to the wavelength. So, I can do a small angle approximation and write this as beta into delta. Beta is omega into square root L c and delta is of course, the length of the transmission line. You can see here that square root of c can be cancelled and what you get is j omega L into delta. There is a very short piece of transmission line which has been short circuited on the other end. The input impedance just above about a small distance delta from the, from the short circuited line actually gives you reactive impedance. In fact, you can vary the frequency and change the amount of reactance that you are going to see. Right? Uh, well, of course, you change the frequency then lambda changes. So, the value of delta will not be the same it has to also change, but you get the idea. You can actually get in fact, if you do not do this approximation, just assume that you can change the frequency omega, then omega changes, f changes, lambda changes, lambda and L relationship changes, beta into L product changes, tan beta L will change giving you any value of reactance that you want. In fact, if I plot the reactance as a function of beta into L for this transmission line, you will see that when beta L is small and 0, the reactance is you know 0 already and as beta L goes towards pi by 2, the reactance rises to infinity. So, at pi by 2, the reactance would have become plus infinity. This is when you have short circuited the load okay, and you get a inductive impedance over this side. Of course, what would happen when beta L is negative or you know you just go to the other end where you go from pi by 2 to 3 pi by 2, you will see that there will be a capacitive reactance that would come up from pi by 2 to pi and again from pi to 3 pi by 2, you will go back to the inductance. So, the same piece of transmission line when it is terminated with a short circuit and when you change beta L either by changing omega or by changing L okay, or by changing the product of these two, it is possible for you to go from an inductive reactance of any value. You want to value, you want to find a value of this one, you will be able to find it by considering the length of the transmission length to be something like this. Okay. So, any length you, you want if you fabricate a lossless transmission line and terminate it with short circuit, you can get inductive reactance, you can get capacitive reactance, you can get inductive reactance again. What would be the behavior for a case of a circuit uh, transmission line that is open circuited at the load side? Before answering that question, let us look at a very interesting scenario. I know that the short circuited transmission line of a length L will have an impedance, input impedance of plus j z 0 tan beta into L. right? 
So, as I go from beta L equal to uh, 0 to pi by 2, this value was always positive giving you a inductive value, right. But what would have, what was the impedance value ZSC at beta L equal to pi by 2? At beta L equal to pi by 2, tan pi by 2 was actually giving you infinity and the value of ZSC was actually equal to infinity, right. So, you actually started off with a transmission line which was short circuited and then you started extending or you started measuring the voltage, sorry, measuring the impedance at different points and you moved a distance of about lambda by 4. Why lambda by 4? Because beta L equal to pi by 2 implies that L must be equal to lambda by 4 because you see here beta is 2 pi by lambda, pi cancels L equal to lambda by 4. So, as you start moving along the transmission line and come to a distance of lambda by 4, you actually see that this input impedance here as seen at a distance of lambda by 4 from the load will look like an open circuit. If you again move another lambda by 4 distance, then again it will look like a short circuit. Thus, if you move a total distance of lambda by 2, you are back to the same situation where the impedance will be exactly equal to the impedance of the other side. Of course, this all works for a lossless transmission line, but this is a very interesting behavior. So, on this transmission line, lossless transmission line, impedances are periodic, okay. Impedance is periodic with a period of lambda by 2, a fact that will be very important when we discuss Smith chart, okay. In fact, what this L equal to lambda by 4 kind of a transmission line, this is this is affectionately called as quarter wave transformer. I have already alluded to what is quarter wave transformer in the earlier module, okay. It is quarter wave because it is lambda by 4, okay. So, what this lambda by 4 transformer does is, it turns a short circuit into an open circuit. It can also turn an open circuit into a short circuit. In case you start with an inductance, it can turn it into a capacitance. You can start with a capacitance and obtain or turn it into an inductor. So, the same load will show impedance, different impedance at different points along the transmission line and this magic can happen because of this particular relationship. In fact, you can easily show that this is true for a general case by going back to the expression for Z in. I know Z in is Z 0 into Z L plus J Z 0. Now, tan beta L, this would be infinity divided by Z0 plus JZL tan beta L. So, again when tan beta L goes to infinity, then this relationship is actually equal to Z0 into uh, Z0 divided by ZL or Z0 square by ZL. You can see that no matter what ZL I take, after traveling lambda by 4, I will obtain 1 by ZL. So, I would have inverted the load impedance. Inductor turns to a capacitor, capacitor turns into an inductor. So, this is all about the relationship between input impedance and the length of the transmission line that I wanted to talk to you about. In the next module, we will see that you know you do not have to uh, use calculators or use these complicated formulas to always transform one impedance to another impedance because in a typical transmission line problem, especially when you are constructing something on a printed circuit board, you will have lot of components and many of these components will be connected by transmission line. If you have to go back to these equations all the time to transform impedances, that will be not only not intuitive to you, you will not understand what is happening, it is just some calculator buttons that you are pressing. The second problem is that even pressing the calculator buttons is very tedious task, okay. So, both you do not get an understanding from what is happening and this is also very difficult to keep doing it. You can write a program, but still it is a, you know, if you write a program then you lose the intuition. So, because of this, people have developed graphical ways of addressing this impedance transformation formula, I mean transformation problems and we will see one very famous graphical aid which really illustrates how these impedances are transforming across the transmission line and helps you solve many, many transmission line problems without in fact using a calculator, okay. It's that miracle uh, graphical help is called a Smith chart and the equations that describe the Smith chart is what we are going to take up in the next module. Thank you very much.